I stood tiptoe upon a little hill. A poem by John Keats. I stood tiptoe upon a little hill. The air was cooling and so very still that the sweet birds, which with a modest pride pull droopingly in slanting curve aside their scantly leaved and finely tapering stems, had not yet lost those starry diadems caught from the early sobbing of the morn. The clouds were pure and white as flocks new shorn and fresh from the clear brook. Sweetly they slept on the blue fields of heaven, and then there crept a little noiseless noise among the leaves born of the very sigh that silence heaves. For not the faintest motion could be seen of all the shades that slanted o'er the green. There was wide wandering for the greediest eye to peer about upon variety, far round the horizon's crystal air to skim and trace the dwindled edges of its brim, to picture out the quaint and curious bending of a fresh woodland alley never ending or by the bowery clefts and leafy shelves guess where the jaunty streams refresh themselves. I gazed a while, and felt as light and free as though the fanning wings of mercury had played upon my heels. I was light-hearted, and many pleasures to my vision started, so I straightway began to pluck a posy of luxuries bright, milky, soft, and rosy. A bush of mayflowers with the bees about them. Ah, sure, no tasteful nook would be without them. And let a lush laburnum oversweep them, and let long grass grow round the roots to keep them moist, cool and green, and shade the violets that they may bind the moss in leafy nets. A filbert hedge with wild briar overtwined and clumps of woodbine taking the soft wind upon their summer thrones, there too should be the frequent checker of a youngling tree that with a score of light green brethren shoots from the quaint mossiness of aged roots, round which is heard a spring head of clear waters babbling so wildly of its lovely daughters the spreading bluebells. It may haply mourn that such fair clusters should be rudely torn from their fresh beds and scattered thoughtless lie by infant hands left on the path to die. Open afresh, you round and starry folds, ye ardent marigolds. Dry up the moisture from your golden lids, for great Apollo bids that in these days your praises should be sung on many harps which he has lately strung. And when again your dewiness he kisses, tell him I have you in my world of blisses. So haply when I rove in some far vale, his mighty voice may come upon the gale. Here are sweet peas, on tiptoe for a flight, With wings of gentle flush or delicate white, And taper fingers catching at all things To bind them all about with tiny rings. Linger a while upon some bending planks That lean against the streamlet's rushy banks, And watch intently nature's gentle doings. They will be found softer than ring doves' cooings. How silent comes the water round that bend. Not the minutest whisper does it send to the o'erhanging sallows. Blades of grass slowly across the chequered shadows pass. Why, you might read two sonnets ere they reach to where the hurrying freshness is. I preach a natural sermon o'er their pebbly beds, where swarms of minnows show their little heads. Staying their wavy bodies against the streams To taste the luxury of sunny beams Tempered with coolness. How they ever wrestle With their own sweet delight and ever nestle Their silver bellies on the pebbly sand. If you but scantly hold out the hand, That very instant not one will remain, But turn your eye and they are there again. The ripples seem right glad to reach those cresses and call themselves among the emerald tresses. The while they call themselves, they freshness give and moisture that the bowery green may live. 
so keeping up an interchange of favours like good men in the truth of their behaviours. Sometimes goldfinches one by one will drop from low-hung branches, little space they stop, but sip and twitter and their feathers sleek, then off at once as in a wanton freak, or perhaps to show their black and golden wings pausing upon their yellow flutterings. Were I in such a place I sure should pray that naught less sweet might call my thoughts away than the soft rustle of a maiden's gown fanning away the dandelion's down, than the light music of her nimble toes patting against the sorrel as she goes. How she would start and blush thus to be caught, playing in her innocence of thought. Oh, let me lead her gently o'er the brook, watch her half-smiling lips and downward look. Oh, let me for one moment touch her wrist. Let me one moment to her breathing list. And as she leaves me, may she often turn, her fair eyes looking through her locks auburn. What next? A tuft of evening primroses, or which the mind may hover till it dozes, or which it well might take a pleasant sleep, but that tis ever startled by the leap of buds into ripe flowers, or by the flitting of diverse moths that I their rest are quitting, or by the moon lifting her silver rim above a cloud, and with a gradual swim coming into the blue with all her light. O oh, maker of sweet poets, dear delight of this fair world and all its gentle livers, spangler of clouds, halo of crystal rivers, mingler with leaves and dew and tumbling streams, Closer of lovely eyes to lovely dreams. Lover of loneliness and wandering. Of upcast eye and tender pondering. Thee must I praise above all other glories That smile us on to tell delightful stories. For what has made the sage or poet right But the fair paradise of nature's light? In the calm grandeur of a sober line we see the waving of the mountain pine, and when a tale is beautifully stayed, we feel the safety of a hawthorn glade. When it is moving on luxurious wings, the soul is lost in pleasant smotherings. Fair dewy roses brush against our faces, and flowering laurels spring from diamond vases. O'erhead we see the jasmine and sweetbriar, and bloomy grapes laughing from green attire while at our feet the voice of crystal bubbles charms us at once away from all our troubles, so that we feel uplifted from the world, walking upon the white clouds wreathed and curled. So felt he who first told how Psyche went on the smooth wind to the realms of wonderment. What Psyche felt and love when their full lips first touched, what amorous and fondling nips they gave each other's cheeks, with all their sighs, and how they kissed each other's tremulous eyes, the silver lamp, the ravishment, the wonder, the darkness, loneliness, the fearful thunder. Their woes gone by, and both to heaven upflown, to bow for gratitude before Jove's throne. So did he feel who pulled the boughs aside that we might look into a forest wide to catch a glimpse of fawns and dryads coming with softest rustle through the trees and garlands woven of flowers wild and sweet upheld on ivory wrists or sporting feet telling us how fair trembling syrinx fled Arcadian Pan with such a fearful dread. Poor nymph, poor Pan. How he did weep to find naught but a lovely sighing of the wind. Along the reedy stream a half-heard strain full of sweet desolation, balmy pain. What first inspired a bard of old to sing, Narcissus pining o'er the untainted spring? In some delicious ramble he had found a little space with boughs all woven round, and in the midst of all a clearer pool than air reflected in its pleasant cool, the blue sky here and there 
serenely peeping through tendril wreaths fantastically creeping. And on the bank a lonely flower he spied, a meek and forlorn flower with naught of pride, drooping its beauty o'er the watery clearness to woo its own sad image into nearness. Deaf to light Zephyrus it would not move, but still would seem to droop, to pine, to love. So, while the poet stood in this sweet spot, some fainter gleamings o'er his fancy shot. Nor was it long ere he had told the tale of young Narcissus and sad Echo's bale. Where had he been, from whose warm head outflew that sweetest of all songs that ever knew, that eye-refreshing, pure deliciousness coming ever to bless the wanderer by moonlight? To him bringing shapes from the invisible world, Unearthly singing from out the middle air, from flowery nests, and from the pillowy silkiness that rests full in the speculation of the stars. Ah, surely he had burst our mortal bars, into some wondrous region he had gone, to search for thee, divine Endymion. He was a poet, sure a lover too, who stood on Latmus' top, what time there blew, soft breezes from the myrtle vale below, and brought in faintness solemn, sweet, and slow a hymn from Diane's temple. While upswelling, the incense went to her own starry dwelling. But though her face was clear as infant's eyes, though she stood smiling o'er the sacrifice, the poet wept at her so piteous fate, wept that such beauty should be desolate. So in fine wrath, some golden sounds he won, and gave meek Cynthia her Endymion. Queen of the wide air, thou most lovely queen of all the brightness that mine eyes have seen. As thou exceedest all things in thy shine, so every tale does this sweet tale of thine. Oh, for three words of honey that I might tell but one wonder of thy bridal night. Where distant ships do seem to show their keels, Phoebus awhile delayed his mighty wheels, And turned to smile upon thy bashful eyes, Ere he his unseen pomp would solemnize. The evening weather was so bright and clear, That men of health were of unusual cheer, Stepping like Homer at the trumpet's call, Or young Apollo on the pedestal, And lovely women were as fair and warm, as Venus looking sideways in alarm. The breezes were ethereal and pure, and crept through half-closed lattices to cure the languid sick. It cooled their fevered sleep, and soothed them into slumbers full and deep. Soon they awoke clear-eyed, nor burnt with thirsting, nor with hot fingers, nor with temples bursting. And springing up, they met the wondering sight of their dear friends, nigh foolish with delight, who feel their arms and breasts and kiss and stare, and on their placid foreheads part the hair. Young men and maidens at each other gazed, with hands held back and motions amazed, to see the brightness in each other's eyes. And so they stood, filled with a sweet surprise, until their tongues were loosed in poesy. Therefore no lover did of anguish die. But the soft numbers in that moment spoken made silken ties that never may be broken. Cynthia, I cannot tell the greater blisses that followed thine and thy dear shepherd's kisses. Was there a poet born? But now no more. My wandering spirit must no further soar.